according to the will of the people of Kashmir. So once again, I'm thankful for your presence. I'm to all my speakers and students and look forward to a very, very productive one day seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, event has been made possible, uh, Institute of Policy, uh, Islamabad Policy Institute and Professor Sayyid Institute and he has a vast experience more than four decades of higher teaching in both within the country and outside. He is uh, he's both linguistic, English teacher as well as the higher uh, education as his speciality. And this institute, this is doing remarkable work in policy briefs and the report also outside. So I welcome uh, Professor Sayyid Sajjad Bukhari to say a few words. President Muhammad Ali, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Institute and Kaidarun University's Department Defense and Strategic Studies. At the outset, we with us here today. I would also like to thank speakers for joining us on this very vital importance. Ladies and gentlemen, denial of self-determination for Kashmir in 1947 continues to have its consequences until now. The situation deteriorated further when BJP government, inspired and motivated by its ideological fountainhead, the Hindu fascist, the Hindu fascist RSS, to illegally and unconstitutionally divide, uh, to illegally and unconstitutionally annex occupied Kashmir on the 5th of August and, intens and intensified its brutal repression of the local population. India's ruthless action, including arrest of thousands of the activists and politicians, imposition of curfew and blackout of the internet and phone lines only serve to further inflame resentment against the Indian occupation. There has been very little change in the situation in the valley ever since imposition of this lockdown. Even though India is desperately trying to mislead the world that the situation is returning to normalcy. And while there is this humanitarian angle in which 8 million Kashmiris are facing outright repression and violation of basic human rights. Amid strong discontentment amongst the Kashmiri, Indian move has serious implication for peace and security for this region. The situation is not just problematic because of two states are nuclear states and they are toe to toe. But the more particularly, but, the, but it is particularly worrisome that because of India's hegemonic designs, its pursuance of offensive military doctrines, nuclear 
blackmail and rejection of proposal for and rejection of proposals for strategic restraint and also refusal to follow the path of dialogue to resolve the outstanding issues ceasefire violations along the line of control and the working boundary has witnessed a dramatic spike over the last few years since 2017 it keeps us reminding of the fact how perilous is the security situation how perilous is the security situation we just witnessed some major ceasefire violations over the past couple of days in which several citizens and a soldier were murdered i would like to conclude with the words of caution that the situation is drift that the situation is drifting towards a major escalation if urgent steps are not taken immediately to manage the conflict and subsequently move towards the conflict resolution we must appreciate that pakistan government has done remarkably well in projecting the kashmir dispute at the international level the need of the time is to make the united states and the strategic and economic partners of and the and the economic partners of india to exert more pressure on new delhi to give up its inflexibility and engage with pakistan for finding a solution to this very complicated issue thank you ambassador and permanent representative to un from 2012 to 2015 uh, i showed him uh, his profile intro he uh, he scratched quite a bit a lot so he doesn't want me to uh, you know to say a lot of things in his uh, uh on his side but i feel that he is a personality uh, who assumes thing and who has been speaking and putting uh, across the pakistan's perspective on very vital issues of national security and primarily kashmir crisis that we are facing these days so over to him i will invite him to say few words here sir dr mohammad ali vice chancellor kaidi azam university professor sayed sajjad bukhari executive director ipi dr shabana fayaz assistant professor department of defense and strategic studies distinguished faculty members and dear students assalamu alaikum i would also like to keep my remarks very brief um i thank the vice chancellor for his assurance that he extended to the people of jammu and kashmir right in the beginning in his opening remarks uh, thank you so much vice chancellor and that means a lot to all the kashmiris and particularly those kashmiris who are in a state of siege right now in the occupied territory and uh, they are being brutalized and they think that they have been abandoned by the world but then when the voices from pakistan go there and they say that they support them they are standing by them that means a lot and i can uh, convey to you this this feeling uh, from the people who have managed to travel abroad the ones who for instance who were either came to pakistan or were in london or new york they would say that this kind of solidarity that you express with the people of jammu and kashmir that really uh, encourages them and reassures them in this uh, very dark dark hour in their history now <clears throat> let me talk about the kashmir conflict and the subject that you have chosen today uh, there are four factors there are four factors which imperil the security in south asia right now first is the turbulent situation in the indian occupied jammu and kashmir as i mentioned earlier 
um, for the past uh, more than two months, in fact, today should be the 78th day of their incarceration and siege, the people of Jammu and Kashmir are being brutalized. And I don't know whether you have full idea of the kind of brutalization that goes on there every day, day in and day out. You know, <clears throat> there I can tell you, just if you want to sit down, I will talk to you. If you want to sit down, I will talk to you a little bit. I just want a settled neighborhood. No, there are a lot of seats. But there is a place in his heart. There is a place in his heart. इधर भी हैं। इधर there are some seats here also. There is a seat here. There is a seat over there. ये इधर सीट है जी। आप इधर आ जाइए ये है ये सिर्फ ओके थैंक यू सो मच आई नीड योर फुल अटेंशन आई नीड योर फुल अटेंशन अनडिवाइडेड अटेंशन सो एंड आई एम ग्लैड टू सी सम ऑफ यू आर जस्ट स्माइलिंग अदर्स आर टेकिंग नोट्स बट आई लव द पीपल वो टेकिंग नोट्स बिकॉज़ दे वुड अब्सोर्ब व्हाट आई हैव टू से मोर क्लोजली एंड मो बस ही बस आप बैठ जाएं तशीश आप भी तशीश यस आई सेड दैट फोर फैक्टर्स आर इम्पेरलिंग द सिक्योरिटी ऑफ साउथ एशिया द फर्स्ट इज द सिचुएशन इटसेल्फ इन द इन इन ऑक्यूपाइड कश्मीर व्हेन इंडिया इन्वेडेड द ऑक्यूपाइड टेरिटरी on August the 5th and then try to bifurcate it and uh, is trying to colonize it. You know, that was the time when we felt, the people in Pakistan and Azad Kashmir felt that uh, the entire territory of Pakistan and Azad Kashmir had been attacked, that we were in a state of war. So since then, there has been a human rights and humanitarian crisis there. What's happening there is every day. May I wait? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm distracted. I'm very easy to distract. असल में हॉल बड़ा नहीं है, छोटी सी जगह है, तो इसमें जो है खुद ही पहले से एक इंटरमेट माहौल हुआ होगा, तो इसमें थोड़ी सी मूवमेंट होती है, तो उससे मैं डिस्ट्रैक्ट हो रहा हूँ। तो थैंक यू सो मच। सो व्हाट आई वाज सेइंग दैट यू हैव टू यू कांट आई मीन यू कांट रियली विजुअलाइज़ द सिचुएशन uh, and I was recently in London and I was talking to the audiences there and I said that uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you must have enjoyed some uh, creature comforts like you must have taken a shower and you will have hot meals today and that you would be able to associate with whomsoever you like and you'd be able to chat with other people but when it comes to the people of Jammu and Kashmir the uh, siege or the lockdown or communication blockade as it is said this is complete and it is so intrusive you know what happens is that you can't talk to each other you can't communicate with each other you can't inquire about the welfare of your family members who are in different cities or townships and uh, uh, streets are deserted therefore in fact the areas which are most volatile there the occupation soldiers have been ordered to keep everybody indoors and if somebody dares to come out uh, they have the orders under the PSA which is called the Public Security Public Safety Act or Armed Forces Special Arts uh, Pass Act to shoot that person to shoot that person uh, 
uh, dead. And therefore, people are incarcerated in their own houses. Uh, then there are midnight raids. I mean, when probably here in Pakistan or elsewhere, you are sound asleep. Um, then uh, what happens is that there are these midnight raids. And during these raids, these uh, uh, occupation soldiers, they kick open the doors, they crash into those houses, they insult the elderly and beat them up, and then they torture uh, the um, young people or they threaten to molest women. They, in fact, I have uh, narrated it on many occasions that uh, there are widespread reports that these people say, particularly to women, that you are our property because we have conquered Kashmir and now we can uh, abduct you if you do not voluntarily marry us. And that's why they have objectified bodies of women and they have also presented them as spoils of war. Uh, this is the kind of feeling that permeates um, the behavior of uh, the occupation forces. Thousands of people have been detained there. Thousands of people, and uh, there was a report by International Federation of Women, in fact, Indian Federation of Women, according to which 13,000 young men have been abducted by the occupation forces. They were first kept in the temporary concentration camps and then they were transferred, the bulk of them were transferred to northern India. So what you saw there was this mass incarceration of young people, some um, uh, boys are as young as 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14. Uh, people are being killed and maimed and blinded and uh, because of this uh, blanket security um, lockdown, uh, news are not coming out. I mean, there are protests going on in every part of Kashmir, but you do not hear about them or read about them. Of course, I mean, the international media, despite all the barricades, they have been able to uh, collect some data and they have broadcast it like the BBC or the Washington Post and other networks, Al Jazeera and TRT, they have broadcast it. But let me tell you that this is the tip of the iceberg. The situation is much more serious there. The second factor that imperils security in South Asia because of the Kashmir is the illicit and illegal steps that India took on August the 5th. And as I mentioned earlier, they invaded the territory. Uh, this was unlawful because they beefed up their presence, presence in, uh, in the in the Indian occupied territory. I mean, before August the fifth, um, the number of troops in the occupied territory was uh, seven hundred thousand. Now it has been beefed up to nine hundred thousand. So it's a massive presence, and probably uh, by far it is the most militarized region in the world. Uh, this has been recognized by everybody. The second, that they uh, in fact bifurcated the territory. Uh, they have separated Ladakh from, the, from Jammu and Kashmir and they have reduced them to the, to the status of municipalities. I mean both are now municipalities. These are federal enclaves which are being governed directly by Delhi. And uh, the third is that they threatened that they would colonize the territory because uh, Kashmiris had these uh, recognized rights for permanent settlement, for permanent residence, also right to education, right to employment, and they had certain privileges in that regard. They had an exclusive prerogative for acquisition of property inside the state. All those rights, they said, had been taken away. And now this, uh, the Valley of Kashmir and other parts of Kashmir would be open for land grab by people all over from India, particularly Hindus, so that they can change the demographic composition of the territory. Now, if you change the demographic composition of the territory, then Muslims would be reduced into a minority. Right now, they are majority in the Jammu and Kashmir state. Uh, they are, as it was mentioned by uh, Professor Bukhari, that that's not all. India has been threatening a war 
or uh, a series of wars against Pakistan. I mean, after, particularly after August the 5th, and of course, they did, conducted that operation in February this year. But they have been saying, uh, and they are, um, by they I mean their cabinet ministers, they have been making these uh, statements, very responsible statements, that they would disintegrate Pakistan, that they would attack Azad Kashmir and retake this territory. They say that this territory belongs to them, which it doesn't, by the way. But uh, so India has whipped up a war psychosis here, and that's not all. India has also threatened to use nuclear weapons. Um, in April this year, um, Prime Minister Modi had threatened to use nuclear weapons against Pakistan, and it made this uh, assertion very blatantly and irresponsibly. And uh, after August the 5th, Rajnath Singh, who is the defense minister of India, he said that uh, India would probably renounce its no first use doctrine and could use nuclear weapons first. So that too imperils the security situation in South Asia. All of this madness that I have uh, outlined is driven by Hindutva, this extremist uh, agenda, this uh, doctrine, this uh, neo-fascist agenda of the Bhatiya Janata Party backed by Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, Bajrang Dal, Vishwa Hindu Parishad, and uh, many other um, um, extremist organizations, violent extremist organizations. Now, what is this uh, doctrine? This doctrine says that uh, um, uh, Akhand Bharat or Bharat Bhumi belongs to Hindus and that it has been polluted by the presence of uh, people following other faiths, Muslims, uh, Christians in particular, also Sikhs to some extent. Uh, they haven't lashed out against the Buddhists, but uh, these faiths have been targeted. They say that it is their belief that uh, Bharat Bhumi would not be pure unless you cleanse it of these uh, people, Muslims and Christians, Muslims in particular. And they have taken many steps in that direction. And of course they have targeted Kashmir, they have also targeted uh, Pakistan, and they have said that Pakistan committed a cardinal sin by uh, creating a separate homeland in, in 1947, and that's why they also contributed to the impurity of Akhand Bharat or Bharat Bhumi. What they're saying is that uh, they would eliminate or annihilate all the Muslims from the from South Asian region, and uh, the steps that they have taken, of course, I mean. They are forcing people to reconvert to Hinduism, forcing Muslims to reconvert to Hinduism. They are also saying that uh, under no circumstances they would eat uh, cow's beef, this is called gauraksha, or transport it from one place to the other, and if uh, there are mob lynchings for that crime. Uh, then they have also said that uh, uh, people who had migrated to India from Muslims who had migrated to India, for instance, in Assam and other states, their citizenship would be abolished. And this they did in Assam by abolishing the citizenship of 1.9 million Muslims. Their only crime was Muslims. This, of course, imperils the security of uh, the entire South Asia. You know, <clears throat> this doctrine... Um, reminds you of the fascist or Nazi doctrines that were pursued by M Mussolini and Hitler in the last century. And at that time, you would see that uh, the rest of the world, the Western countries, I was in London, as I said recently, I reminded the uh, European Parliament and uh, many think tanks there in London, that the United Kingdom and France in the last century, particularly in year 1938, they had signed an agreement with Hitler and Mussolini, and the agreement was called the Munich Agreement. This was the biggest appeasement uh, during that period, and the result was a world war, and the result was that uh, a, it gave an opportunity and a cover to Hitler to earmark one segment of population, and that was the Jews, 
and they said that these are all bad guys and that they are a threat to Germany's security and prosperity and they, they are uh, not human. They were all dehumanized. I mean, they were like deadly beasts. They were projected as deadly uh, manipulative beasts and therefore they eliminated them and annihilated them. The same sort of madness is driving uh, uh, Hindu, Hindutva or this doctrine of violent extremism. As it was mentioned by Professor Bukhari, that the core um, cause, so to say, of this turbulence, of this volatility in our region, and uh, this constant uh, state of uh, war that we find ourselves in, is because of the denial of the right to self-determination to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, I'd come to that a little later, but let me tell you that uh, uh, what was the Pakistan's what was Pakistan's reaction uh, in the aftermath of August the fifth? The entire nation uh, rose as one solid rock, and uh, they expressed their solidarity with the people of Jammu and Kashmir. The nation was united like it was never united before from Karachi to Gwadar to uh, uh, the entire territory of Pakistan to Kunjarab to Gilgit to Azad Kashmir. All people were united in expressing their solidarity with the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Also, uh, the government reached out to the United Nations to other heads of state and government and tried to muster support for rescuing the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and uh, for persuading the world to put pressure on India. So this was Pakistan's reaction. It is uh, appreciated by the people of Jammu and Kashmir. The world reaction was mixed. You know, the, the international media for the first time uh, sided with the people of Jammu and Kashmir. They depicted the true picture of the agony and suffer suffering of the people of Jammu and Kashmir at the hands of the occupation forces. They condemned India's precipitous and brutal steps. So the international media, world parliaments also, I mean, I've been to many parliaments in the recent past, but I think uh, uh, in particular I would mention the European Parliament, the French Parliament, the British Parliament. Mm, they held debates on Kashmir and they underlined the need for the realization of the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, there was uh, a group of uh, um, European Parliament uh, members, members of European Parliament, who even demanded that uh, sanctions be imposed, travel and trade sanctions be imposed against India because of its high-handedness and because of its brutalities in the territory. But, uh, and I, I was in the United States recently also, there I can tell you the 50 congressmen, uh, they wrote letters and there were a bunch of senators who wrote to the President of the United States demanding that uh, uh, the United States should intervene to save the people of Jammu and Kashmir from genocide and uh, to uh, broker some sort of peace in the region because the situation in uh, Jammu and Kashmir was a serious threat to, to the stability of the region. So the reason I mention this because, uh, you know, India was very successful in the past in silencing the voices of the people uh, in different parts of the world, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. And this time, for the first time, people spoke up, people from um, the mainstream political parties, people from the media, they spoke against Indian atrocities. So this, I also say, I have said it on many occasions, that for the first time the international media was uh, able to craft a true narrative of the situation in Kashmir, because we used to confront this false narrative which uh, always would condone or endorse the actions taken by India and they would always talk about terrorism in regard to Kashmir, not self-determination, but for the first time they have spoken about terrorism, uh, spoken about this uh, right to self-determination. 
Uh, when I talked about the threats to war, uh, I'm sure that in this department you must be focusing on the nuclear dimension of the uh, dispute or the nuclear dimension of the India-Pakistan uh, strained relationship. And that I can tell you that scientists have conducted studies in the recent past and some, some experts have conducted studies and they say that if there is a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, which is very much possible because um, you would know as students of uh, strategic studies that uh, the, any conflict between India and Pakistan or a confrontation or uh, exchange cannot just be contained at the convention level, that it would spiral into the strategic level. And uh, the strategic level, it is unpredictable. Both sides have tactical nuclear weapons, but um, even uh, putting them aside, what would happen, I mean, somebody has projected that if uh, these uh, bombs of the size of Little Boy and Fatman of Nagasaki, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if they are exchanged, 15 to 20 bombs, 135 or 135 million people would be killed instantly. This is one. Second, there would be fallout, very dangerous fallout, um, enveloping the entire globe. 2.5 billion people would be uh, affected, directly or indirectly. There would be a food crisis, crops would fail. There would be uh, extreme weather patterns. There would be refugee outflows. There would be global recession. There would be a nuclear apocalypse. So this, these predictions have been um, made by these scientists uh, uh, based on the data that they, they, they managed to collect. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I want to highlight, you must understand that uh, as students uh, of uh, international law and defense and strategic studies that threat to IOK is a threat to Pakistan. It's an existential threat for Pakistan because uh, Pakistan has been in a state of war with India for the past several decades. In the past two decades in particular, India has invested heavily in proxy wars in uh, Balochistan, Karachi, in Fata, in other parts of Pakistan, even in um, Gilgit Baltistan and Azad Kashmir. So you've been exposed to India's aggression for the past several decades. But uh, in the aftermath of uh, uh, the decisions that were announced by India on August 5th, India is going to intensify its proxy wars. Uh, and India is going to uh, prepare to attack Azad Kashmir, also try to disintegrate Pakistan. I mean, don't take this lightly. Uh, here in uh, Pakistan, there's this tendency to be complacent. But uh, India is announcing that it is going to move against Pakistan and that it would disintegrate Pakistan. So Kashmir the operation in Kashmir is a beginning of a series of steps that India would take, including intensification of proxy wars and subversion inside Pakistan. W what kind of responses should we give? First, I think that this unity that we demonstrated um, after August the 5th must be maintained at all costs. Let there be no fissures within our ranks. Let's forge unity and maintain it under all circumstances in regard to Kashmir. I'm glad that all the political parties, while they have their own differences on Kashmir, uh, they have taken a unanimous stand in the parliament and outside the parliament. Second is that I have advocated for years and now I think the state of Pakistan has realized, all its institutions have realized that the bilateral process vis-a-vis -vis India has been a mirage. It has been uh, not just been unproductive, it has been counterproductive. And therefore, you should not go around uh, discussing the possibility of resumption of bilateral dialogue because bilateral dialogue was meant to benefit India, to tell the rest of the world that you cannot interfere or intervene or raise your voices because it's a bilateral matter between 
Delhi and Islamabad. When I was in uh, London in the parliament there, uh, in fact, one of the MPs pointed out that whenever we uh, raise a question, whenever MPs raise a question about uh, the human rights situation in Jammu and Kashmir, FCO, the, their foreign office representative, would always say, but we can't do anything. This is a bilateral matter between India and Pakistan. And they narrowly focus on human rights situation and they restrict themselves to expressing uh, serious concerns. But beyond that, they do not want to do anything at all. So <clears throat> India has used uh, the bilateral dialogue process uh, very deftly to exclude the people of Jammu and Kashmir from the process to exclude the United Nations and now to exclude Pakistan because they say that this is an internal matter. So I think that now the, all the institutions in the state of Pakistan have realized that we have to go back to the international community, particularly to the United Nations Security Council, to the General Assembly, to the Human Rights Council, so that we can build pressure there. And it is, in fact, I mean, if you look at the issue itself, the Kashmir issue, it is uh, an international issue. I mean, to start with, it's not a bilateral issue, it's a trilateral issue because the people of Jammu and Kashmir have to determine their political future. Uh, this is what the UN Security Council resolution says. So India and Pakistan are, are parties to the dispute with the key decisions will be made by the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So I think that the, we must uh, continue to lobby with the international organizations and seek decisions, not just lobby with them, but seek decisions. Uh, as I said, that uh, the international community has crafted a new narrative for you. This narrative was missing from the pages of uh, world press and also television networks. And this narrative is with you. Now, it is your responsibility the students and faculty here and all the students all over Pakistan and uh, I would say civil society activists and human rights activists to um, seize this opportunity and build this narrative because this is a long haul. I mean it's not that Kashmir dispute or the turbulence in Kashmir would come to an end very soon. So that you interface with the international community. Now the international community is ready to talk to you and ready to interact with you. So seize this opportunity for communication which has been opened up by the developments in Kashmir in the recent weeks. Uh, we must use the strengths of our diaspora community. They are very active, they are very angry. In fact, uh, in London, Paris, and Brussels, and in Washington, D.C., and in New York, uh, people take out these rallies and these processions and uh, talking to them I said that this is the time of course for vigils and processions and demonstrations um, but uh, uh, we have to move forward I mean from uh, these processions and demonstrations we have to uh, alter the situation in a man manner influence decisions in such a manner that we get solutions. We have to strategize to get solutions, not just demonstrate constantly. You know, uh, talking to the audiences abroad, I said that, I mean, particularly the diaspora community, they are very active, they want to do whatever they can, and now some of them have influence. I can tell you that in the European Parliament, there are 12 MPs of Pakistani and Kashmiri extraction. And the people are active also in the United States and also in Brussels and Europe, so you can use their strengths uh, to project the voice of the Kashmiris and to seek a solution. Uh, you must have noticed, uh, if you haven't noticed, then I'm going to inform you that uh, after August the 5th, many political parties in India, uh, several, civil society, several civil society organizations and uh, human rights activists, influential writers, they castigated Modi for the steps that he had taken. And they said that this is not the India that they belong to or they would like to live in. So there was this uh, massive reaction from women's groups, from uh, these uh, 
um, civil society activists. What I want to say is that uh, while you using new tools, social media particularly, it is good for us to interface with these voices in India because uh, uh, that too is a pro-peace community, that, that too is pro-self-determination community and we must try to invest uh, in that community. They did so not because we prompted and prodded them, they did so on their own volition. So I think that uh, this we must keep in mind. Last is the last point that I have, is that uh, we must try to strengthen Pakistan and Azad Jammu and Kashmir uh, in all dimensions, particularly in regard to security, uh, economic development, and uh, national unity. Because only a strong Pakistan can guarantee success in regard to Kashmir. If Pakistan is weak and divided and economically non-viable, then we would lose Kashmir in the long run and we would weaken Pakistan as a state. So we must invest massively in economic growth and economic development and most importantly human development because if your populations are marginalized uh, and they are not integrated into the mainstream, they won't be able to uh, become good champions for the freedom and liberty in the people of, uh, for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Last point is that um, there's this... Uh, I was going through your concept paper, and it's a very good concept paper uh, written um, very brilliantly. It, its objective is the aim of the workshop is to bring together leading academicians, policy makers, military officials, young scholars, and students to exchange and share their views and simultaneously enhance their understanding on the emerging security and threat matrix of the region. What I want to say is that I would appeal to all the departments dealing with international law, strategic studies throughout Pakistan and in Azad Kashmir or um, think tanks to move beyond understanding. You know, uh, I mention that because India has moved beyond understanding of um, Pakistani politics or dynamics of Pakistani politics or Pakistan's foreign policy objectives and they have elaborated a strategy and they are implementing that strategy. So right now our effort should not be focused just on understanding this phenomena, this uh, uh, phenomena, phenomena encom encompassing war threats, encompassing uh, other things like for instance uh, these uh, uh, designs of Hindu extremists to disintegrate Pakistan, we should come up with a blueprint, I mean think tanks in particular, a blueprint, a strategy to not only counter Indian moves but to outmaneuver India. And it will have uh, three or four dimensions. One would be of course the pure military dimension or kinetic dimension. And then there would be lots of non-kinetic non dimensions that include uh, economic development, rise of Pakistan as a powerful uh, economic, um, powerful economic uh, um, engine, uh, and then it, it, uh, uh, national unity. Also, you have to, uh, you have no choice but to emerge as a strategic competitor. Because strategic competitor, you already are, but you have to uh, craft yourself as an effective strategic competitor. So that's why I would appeal to the think tanks and the university departments to come up with these strategies, share them with all the stakeholders and the leadership in the country uh, so that they can 
synthesize all these inputs and make informed and effective decisions. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a pleasure to talk to you. small, they are 20 million, and this territory too, they live in that territory, and the territory is uh, 85,000 square miles, it's not a small territory, not a small population, and they are, in fact, the owners of that state. I mean, if you talk about uh, the state itself, the geography, uh, or the territory that they have, they, they are the owners, and they would determine their own fate and the fate of their territory. Am I clear? You wanted just one answer, which was what you thought that it was. But I have given you a perspective. Well, uh, Nirin Modi has uh, postponed his visit to Turkey because Turkey openly supported Pakistan and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, in the United Nations General Assembly, also bilaterally, and uh, President Erdogan has been talking about it. So Modi and his government are going after two countries. One is Turkey and the other is Malaysia. The Malaysian uh, Prime Minister also spoke about invasion and occupation of the territory. So they're very angry and they're uh, using all sorts of threats. They're saying that they will withdraw their investments in these two countries. This is their punitive uh, measure, because India thinks that it's like a superpower and it can now impose sanctions against mm, these two countries. So there are all strains between India and Turkey, and uh, this postponement of the visit is reflective of that. Now, <clears throat> your questions about whether or not the Foreign Office was prepared, I think everybody knew that India was preparing for these steps. And, uh, that uh, we knew it, I mean, everybody, I'm, I'm sure that uh, this department knew about uh, uh, the impending repeal of Article 35A. The people of the occupied territory knew about it. Everybody knew about it. And the Foreign Office, in fact, uh, was monitoring the situation very closely. But uh, did we inform the United Nations regularly? I asked Foreign Minister and Foreign Secretary, they've been writing these communications to the Foreign Minister, to the United Nations Security Council, the President and the President of the Security Council and the Secretary General. So this has been going on. Um, could, it, could we have been better prepared? And the answer is yes. As a nation, we would have been better prepared if we had realized that this bilateral channel would not work. For decades, we invested our political will and energy in this useless process, which India used to perpetuate its occupation and uh, to divert the world attention from a very, very important issue. So yes, we could have been better prepared, and we could have then uh, either stalled these uh, aggravating steps or uh, completely repulsed them. Now, the Middle East response, you can divide it into two parts. In fact, one is that uh, the Arab League has been completely silent. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, it issued a communique, it condemned the actions taken by India. So the Muslim Ummah, as a body represented by the OIC, stood by us. But individual governments did not. There were two governments which in fact rewarded and rewarded Modi. And uh, so uh, people were really resentful here. Their sensibilities were hurt deeply. Uh, we understand that. So it's a mixed reaction, but it's not a good reaction, I'll tell you, and 
the people of Pakistan, the people of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, are not satisfied and they think that uh, the Muslim Ummah, which should have stood by them, loudly and clearly have sided, some of them have sided, not all of them, have sided with Narendra Modi. Another thing that I would say is that uh, I have tried to reassure people that the Arab street or the Middle Eastern street is with you. They know that an outrage has been committed in India by their governments because of their own interests like the other Western countries have not spoken up. Uh, they haven't spoken up or they have not, uh, in fact, uh, expressed their concern about the situation. You that uh, you absolutely right, this condemnation is not enough, but condemnation is important, particularly coming from the international community, international media, is important. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I used to tell these Western interlocutors that uh, um, India has imposed a gag order in the occupied territory, and it had extended this gag order to the rest of the world to Brussels or London or Washington, and nobody would dare speak about Kashmir or dare criticize and dare for the human rights violations it was committed. So condemnation in that context is important, but uh, it is not enough. And you, the last point you raised was about future, and we must have a solid planning for the future. It is a world. I think that your Prime Minister spoke in the United Nations General Assembly, and he represented uh, the entire nation or the people of Jammu and Kashmir when he expressed this anger and disappointment of uh, our people. Uh, and he shared it with the international community. He also said that if the international community doesn't intervene, we would be left to our own devices to deal with the situation. So what I want to say is that future, that's why I said that think tanks and departments like yours, they should uh, hold conferences like these, but then they should also have these in-house deliberations and come up with strategy papers. Uh, I outlined my strategy while I was speaking, and uh, some of the facets are that um, massive investment in economic development of Pakistan. Second is uh, going back to the international community, build pressure from there. Third is using and leveraging the strengths of the diaspora community also, uh, and there were a few other points. So I mean, these were my suggestions. Another point that I did not highlight was that we should all be prepared for a war. And the preparedness should not be only at the level of the armed forces of Pakistan, because they're already prepared. It is their full-time job. Uh, but the nation should be prepared, because uh, I have told many audiences that uh, Mohan Bhagwat, who is the chief of RSS Rashtriya Swayam Sayyot Sangh, he is preparing uh, hundreds of thousands of young men and women. They have uh, two brigades, one for men and one for women. And uh, he is preparing them for a war with Pakistan. And he's also preparing young men to join the armed forces of India so that ultimately they pursue the uh, RSS policy and doctrine. So my question to all of you is that uh, are you preparing? Are we preparing for that kind of war? Uh, the last point that I have is that people think that this war if there is a war between India and Pakistan, would be fought in Srinagar or Delhi or in, in the Indian territory. What if this war is fought here in your territory, in your houses and in your neighborhoods? Uh, would you be prepared for that kind of war? I've been told by your protocol that you also have to attend another meeting. For, for years. And when we are very insistent and the international community encourages them, it's pointless to engage with India bilaterally. Uh, second is that um, if there's a plebiscite, 
would uh, Pakistan be ready to withdraw its troops from the Azad Demolition Territory? Yes, but in accordance with the uh, Resolution 98 of the UN Security Council resolutions. Or probably just that, that resolution will have to be updated because at that time this resolution had mandated that there would be withdrawal of troops from both sides. Uh, from the Indian side, I mean from the Indian occupied side, and from Pakistani side, from Azad Kashmir side. And the withdrawal of the troops has to be proportionate. And it has to be simultaneous, because India at that time in the 1950s said that you withdraw first and then we'll follow. And we said no, we will do it simultaneously. The unilateral, uh, well, we can't, as a matter of fact, uh, pursue who asked about unilateral. We can't afford to have a unilateral stance. We would continue to have a multilateral stance. Because uh, that territory that belongs to the people of Jammu and Kashmir and that wanted to accede to Pakistan is under the occupation of India. And now they have it annexed it also. So, I mean, that's why we would try to keep uh, a multilateral uh, orientation for the dispute. And the last one is GB. You asked a very, very complex question, and I'm sure that you built many nuances into it, and I can't respond to it directly. Uh, it requires a detailed response. But what I can tell you is that I was in, on uh, August the 5th, um, by the way, I was in Gilgit, Pakistan, and I visited uh, Gilgit and Hunza. And uh, the feeling I get that the people there are very keen to become a province, but uh, the Azad Kashmir political leadership and the Jammu Kashmir, um, the occupied Kashmir leadership uh, feels that if uh, Gilgit Pakistan becomes a province, then we will probably uh, be weakening our case in regard to Kashmir. That said, I think that uh, we respect the aspirations of the people of uh, Gilgit Pakistan. Uh, we believe that they should be given all the rights uh, fully, 100%. And uh, I was also shocked to learn that uh, back in 1974, um, the state subject rights of uh, GB were taken away. And people are very bitter about it. So I think that that requires some sort of redress and dialogue to that effect is taking place between the representatives of Gilgit Pakistan and Pakistan.